against the revolution. Obviously, the, the nobles and the church uh, and the king and the queen, who was very influential, they were all upset. They had lost their uh, previous power and uh, they were not reconciled to this new government. They were intriguing. And the most important uh, um, element was the church because the rest of them uh, the, uh, had no credibility with the population, but the church did, especially in the more uh, remote areas of France where the economy was less developed and so on. The church still had a considerable grip on the population. It had lost its property. One of the things that the new uh, revolutionary government did was to confiscate the property of the, uh, of the church. Basically, they sold it off to the middle class, a lot of property. Um, and so the church was really, uh, especially the upper clergy, were very uh, angry. And they had some power. So uh, by 1792, there was a considerable degree of counter-revolutionary activity in France, challenges to the, uh, the revolutionary government. And meanwhile, uh, outside of France, Austria and Prussia, these two uh, powers on the continent, um, well, uh, Marie Antoinette was, uh, was a daughter of the Habsburg uh, Empire, and uh, Prussia was allied with Austria, and they were alarmed but that the revolution could spread uh, to the rest of Europe, including their own territories, and so um, there were a series of provocations and so on, and the French uh, declared war on Austria and France. And the thing is that the French armies, which was officered by nobles, was not um, well led, and it was disorganized by the revolution, and so the Prussians and the Austrians were advancing into France. So you have a real crisis, economic crisis, and now there's war, and it, it, it could happen that uh, the, uh, the old regime could come, come back, could be restored. And in this uh, uh, eventuality, in these circumstances, the people of Paris, led by political radicals, uh, staged a second revolution. In 1792, they overthrew the monarchy altogether, declared a republic, and this particular political party, the Jacobins, led by Robespierre, uh, took power. And what they faced was uh, how to deal with the counter-revolution. So uh, what they did was, first of all, they arrested a lot and, and put on trial a lot of counter-revolutionaries. They arrested thousands and thousands of people and Thousands and thousands of people were killed in what we call the reign of terror. A way, it's a way of dealing with people who are opposed to the government. They just killed them. Um, and so uh, this, of course, was remembered and so on. It played up. They didn't. Uh, people didn't speak about the subsequent white terror that happened. Uh, it was tit for tat. I mean, people were being killed on the left and right and so on. But they paid attention to these events, the guillotine and all that. I mean, I'm sure you've seen dramatizations of all this. But uh, very significantly, what the Jacobins did in order to consolidate the support of the common people was, first of all, they declared a political democracy. Everybody could vote. The ordinary people who had made the revolution now could participate in politics. And the second thing is, Given the economic crisis and given that particularly the price of bread, remember I explained that that was, that had become a very, very serious problem. Uh, bread was um, too expensive. And so they uh, basically fixed the price of bread. Uh, they imposed what they call the maximum. Bakers, millers, grain millers could not charge more than a certain amount for bread. And they proceeded to sort of organized the whole economy to fight the Prussians and the Austrians. 
So political democracy and a maximum and close regulation of the economy at this point. Indeed, Rothschild declared that um, yes, the uh, the revolution in 1789 had declared property rights as a human right. This is the first time that this was done, you know, in very explicit terms with judicial decisions in England. Uh, but uh, now, Rothschild says the right to subsistence is a human right. The right to subsist. That is to say. Everybody has the right to uh, access food. The government has to guarantee access to food in order for people to survive. Um, and this was a, 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 at this point, of course, Adam Smith's ideas of no government interference were had been the dominant uh, sort of uh, narrative economically. I explained to Adam Smith. Um, and this was now a complete reversal of that when they were regulating the economy and so on. And so um, this was, um, these were radical measures and they enabled the government to get the democracy and the regulation of the economy, especially of bread. They uh, enabled the government to win over the support of the mass of the population. And Hundreds of thousands of, of uh, peasants and craftsmen joined the French army. Uh, well, this is called the National Mobilization or the Levee en masse. And they defeated the Prussians and Austrians, the French armies, using huge masses of freshly trained recruits, were able to defeat the highly trained Austrian Prussian troops. Um, and indeed, as a result, uh, in fact, French armies were able to advance into the neighboring countries and begin to spread the same ideas of liberty, equality, and fraternity to other uh, nearby countries. Um, now, um, with the success by 1794, we're getting towards the early fall, uh, really, uh, France, the revolution had been saved, and uh, there was a lot of restlessness um, with the government of Robespierre. And so um, the reign of terror was uh, uh, irritating to people. And so on the 9th of Thermidor, they had a new calendar. The 9th of Thermidor, uh, Robespierre was overthrown. And a new, more conservative government took over, which immediately canceled the democratic elements. So between 1794 and 1799, France is under a more conservative government known as the Directory. But this government was weak politically because the masses who wanted a regulated economy and they wanted democracy uh, were excluded, and the counter-revolution was still there. So this government was a, a government that tried to negotiate between the, the counter-revolutionaries and the radicalized masses. And so it was politically weak, and this facilitated um, the ascendancy of a very popular general, the general who emerged from uh, the success of battles that the French were fighting uh, all over Europe was Napoleon Bonaparte. And um, on the 18th Brumaire, 1799, he seized power. He was backed by some of the richest people in France, richest members of the middle class who wanted a stable government. And Napoleon imposed basically his dictatorship between 1799 and 1815. 1815, Napoleon conquered the whole of Europe except for Russia. And he led the French to glory. There was a great outburst of uh, patriotism. They were able to mesmerize people by these conquests. They, people participated in the plundering of these different European countries. 
he's an ordinary soldier sometimes. And um, so Napoleon was popular in a certain way, and he provided stability. Um, and so he ruled, and um, from becoming the head of a government in 1799, he became emperor in 1803. You have an uh, authoritarian government in France, and um, all of the sort of representative and democratic elements is eliminated from the government. Does this mean that uh, basically a monarchy has come back? Or, or what, what, was, what was this revolution uh, when, after all, we see Louis the Sixteenth has gotten rid of, but by 1803, Napoleon is an absolute ruler. Uh, there seems to be no change. But in fact, although he did get rid of the sort of constitutional representative government and uh, democracy, uh, in fact, he consolidated most of the gains of the revolution were consolidated under Napoleon. Um, and um, the, um, uh, so that now I'm sort of explaining what the gains of the revolution were. Uh, feudalism and privilege, uh, these things did not return. There was uh, equality before the law and equality of opportunity now in France. No longer you know, do you have these privileged classes in France and so on. No, feudalism and, um, and privilege are done away with. Um, the peasants can, uh, the peasants are freed from being directly dependent on the nobles. Feudalism is gone. Um, furthermore, um, absolute property rights uh, careers open to uh, um, opportunity, uh, to, uh, careers open to talent. Uh, these are real gains, especially for the middle class. Uh, these are consolidated and a new uh, national code of law is established, which writes down all of these gains. Uh, this is called the uh, Napoleonic Code or the Code Napoleon, which becomes a um, a highly rationalized system of law for France and for the rest of Europe. Uh, the Code Napoleon uh, is the uh, the law code of Europe, except for England and uh, the Anglo-Saxon countries. It is the law code, basically, of Quebec. Um, so, um, um, and so these are real gains. And also, um, Napoleon, of course, uh, the revolution had taken away the property of the church. Uh, but um, in 1801, Napoleon um, uh, reaches an agreement with the papacy, the uh, Concordat Agreement in which the Catholic Church is allowed to sort of operate in France, but it is no longer the established church. There is a separation of church and state in France, which remains permanent from this point onward. And indeed, religious toleration is established in France for Protestants who did not, who did not have rights before, for Jews, and for people of all other religions. So there is a sep permanent separation of church and state. And uh, there is, uh, you know, France before the revolution was this great confusion. France had emerged as a state piecemeal over centuries. Every region had its own laws, its own system of weights and measures, and so on. Now everything is made. There's a huge administrative reform, and everything is sort of organized according to uh, a strong central government and rational administrative principle. Um, for example, the internal tolls that I spoke about earlier are abolished. Um, the um, 
a metric system as a system of measurement. We use the metric system, which we adopted some years ago, and well, that was created by the French during their revolution, spread to the rest of the world. Um, so weights and measures are all made measured, made uniform, and so business people from one place in uh, France to another, that they're, they're using the same system of measurement. Um, and things like a national bank, a sound currency, um, all of these things are now established. And of course, uh, the whole system of provinces is basically uh, put on the shelf and you have uniform administrative departments. There are these, well, the French uh, uh, sort of system of local administration is based on the department. And all of them basically operate according to the same principles. So uh, to uh, look at this from the point of view of business, now you have a common system of weights and measures. You have uh, every, uh, each uh, uh, local administrative unit operates in the same way and so on. And there's free movement. Now, so these were the major gains. And ultimately, of course, uh, France did become a constitutional representative state. Democracy was uh, fully established. The democracy that we understand was fully established in France in, 19, in 1871. France became a fully democratic republic in 1871, um, but not under Napoleon, of course, he was an autocrat. Uh, but never, nevertheless, you, you can see that these gains, legal gains and um, administrative gains, uh, they basically now, the whole superstructure has been changed and it is now possible for business people to operate uh, according to rational principles, and also uh, they can, because there is equality, these people become the ruling class in French society. The middle class becomes the ruling class. Uh, and well, um, the uh, traditional classes are swept to the side. Now, um, ultimately, of course, um, Napoleon was overthrown, and he was overthrown for two reasons. First of all, he, uh, the, the, the French invaded and they conquered virtually all of, the, of Europe and French armies were all over and um, the French either directly or indirectly controlled all the governments of Europe and uh, the, of course the French were experiencing glory days. Uh, conquest is intoxicating. And there were a lot of economic benefits from this as well. Um, but the um, subject peoples, um, there was a reaction amongst the occupied peoples. Um, nationalism began to develop. The French had their nationalism. National, this is new. Uh, the nationalism as, a, as an idea is born during the upheavals, first in France and then in reaction in Germany and in Spain in particular, there is um, the development of rival nationalisms opposed to French domination. And insurgencies begin to develop against the presence of the French. And then Napoleon has this stupid idea, or he's, uh, you know, a megalomania. Uh, he invades Russia, and there he uh, this, uh, he meets his nemesis, uh, the Russians, the Russian winter, and so on. And the, uh, the, the Napoleonic army, which was composed of half a million men, 500,000 men, uh, they invade Russia and they, most of them never return. Uh, they are finished off by Russia and the Russian winter. I won't say that about today, but pay attention. So that's the story of the French Revolution and from this point onwards we're dealing with
modern history, but there's one subject left, and that is the Industrial Revolution, which I now want to talk about. Um, so, I, uh, what was the Industrial Revolution? Well, it, it first it developed first in England from about 1760 onwards. And we could say it was more or less completed by about 1840 in England. And meanwhile, it spread to the continent, it spread to the European continent and eventually to the United States, etc. And what uh, fundamentally this was about was that well, I have spoken about capital, this curious concept and so on, and uh, that really starts in the 16th century. And uh, we, we've talked about it in commercial financial capital, and there's a certain amount of investment in, in agriculture and so on, uh, as you read. But now we see the entry of capital into industrial um, production. The entry of capital, the entry of large amounts of capital into industrial production. And therefore, the uh, gigantic expansion of industrial production as a result of these um, investments in capital successively. And we see this uh, in the emergence, first of all, of cotton factories, and then wool factories, and then we see factories that are begin to produce steam engines, and eventually factories that begin to produce um, railways, steam engines harnessed to carriages, and the laying down of track. So we can say it's about the concentration and mechanization of industrial production. The concentration and, and um, the mechanization of industrial production. And the product of that is the factory system, the uh, reorganization of production between the factories and the manifestations, of course, in the steam engine and the railways. And of course, the railways require enormous investment in iron and steel production. So uh, that's quite important. So um, that's what uh, the Industrial Revolution was about. Um, and I think you can sort of understand that I'm going to explain it uh, uh, as best I can in terms of four revolutions and one counter-revolution. Four revolutions and one counter-revolution. Well, what were the four revolutions that, what were the causes? The causes were four revolutions and one counter-revolution. So what were the four revolutions? First of all, uh, political change. We had to create a new uh, political structure, and we went into that in detail. We talked about um, the, uh, the massive changes that occurred in England as a result of their revolutions during the 17th century. And by the 18th century, they had a constitutional government. And this means that there is a representative assembly. It's not democratic, but rather the people who sit in the representative assembly. They basically are privileged, rich people sit in the, in the parliament. And it is the parliament is basically an assembly of business people or better their representatives. Lawyers who represent business interests sit in the parliament. So the sovereign ins institution, has anything changed? Uh, the sovereign institution is basically a collection of lawyers who basically supervise the state finances and administration. That's the setup. Um, they make the laws. And certainly um, fundamental to that is the protection of property rights. And of course, in England, we see uh, things like the establishment of the Bank of England, the sound currency, um, a national debt, 
And all of this is kind of rationalized by uh, John Locke, as we saw, this theory of uh, legitimate government based on the right to revolution, based on um, basically the principles of uh, empiricism and um, uh, contract theory. So the first revolution is political. And of course, we, did, we just saw that in France, basically, the, in, in, it didn't come out quite the same way. But uh, in France, the same thing happens a, a, a century and a half later, 1789. It's the same deal. Third, we had the Dutch Revolution, then we had the English Revolution, now we have the French Revolution. The second revolution is the commercial revolution. Uh, now, we saw that uh, by the 18th century, mercantilism was the dominant um, theory. Mercantilism in, uh, entailed uh, uh, a lot of, uh, of government supervision over the economy, particularly exports and imports, protection for uh, native industries, protecting the native industries, and excluding the manufactured goods of other countries. And the whole idea was to have a positive balance of um, um, ba uh, balance of payments, to accumulate money within the country to have a positive balance of payments. Um, so protectionism was fundamental, and it protected industry, uh, the development of English industry, as we see. Um, but also um, the uh, the state uh, plays a huge role in the development of markets. Uh, it um, it uh, has all kinds of colonial ventures. We saw the English state, and the way they operated in the 18th century, their success. Um, we, we have um, uh, wars with the French to, to sort of uh, make sure that uh, the English are primary in world trade. Um, we have, um, as a result of this, uh, particularly the con uh, English economic conquest of Latin America and India, and not to speak of North America, um, Canada, and for a while, the 13 uh, American colonies. Um, we have the slavery, which produces huge profits, which could be reinvested in, in, in developing factories. Um, we have the development of, as we saw, a banking system. Finance capital can operate smoothly uh, in this system. We have the development of a merchant marine, the English merchant marine, um, and uh, the merchant marine of other states, for that matter. Um, and also, then, in places like England and places like Bristol or Portsmouth, uh, or London, uh, you have uh, these fantastic port systems, warehouses, docks, wharves, uh, roadways, and in, within the country, the development of roads and turnpikes and canals are constructed during the 18th century to facilitate trade. So what I'm saying is, if you take all of this together, it, it constitutes a commercial revolution a vast network, both on land and sea, which facilitates trade. So you have the political revolution, you have the commercial revolution. And the third revolution was the scientific and technological revolution. Um, uh, in the 17th century, we have the scientific revolution. The lead, there are uh, names like Copernicus and Kepler and Galileo, but the most famous is Newton. He unifies all of these uh, scientific breakthroughs into a unified uh, system. And meanwhile, um, so some of the principles of Newton, the physics of Newton, um, get applied to the development of new technologies. Uh, some of, a lot of this technology is actually invented by craftsmen, artisans, it was based on sort of uh, tinkering in workshops and so on. Um, but um, uh, nevertheless, 
that you have a gradual unification of scientific theory and sort of technological innovation. People see that there are underlying physical principles that you can use to invent, uh, make uh, new inventions. And even mechanics, ordinary craftsmen begin to pick up on the principles of Newton. And a certain scientific culture develops in England, scientific technological culture around this commercial and industrial revolution. And uh, we do have, by the end of the 17th century, and Newton is one of the founders, of something called the Royal Society, which all of the scientists in England joined this Royal Society. Science became institutionalized, see? And the Royal Society took a great interest in new technological devices. So both at the sort of level of tinkering by craftsmen and at the level of theory, you have the development of this new scientific and technical culture. So we have a political revolution. We have a um, commercial revolution. We have a scientific revolution. And then in the 18th century, this had already begun to happen with enclosures back in the 16th century, but in the 18th century, a lot of enterprising farmers or even their landlords, in some cases, take an interest in developing uh, more profitable agriculture. So you see a lot of investment in what came to be called the agricultural revolution. England produces more and more food. It becomes self-sufficient in the production of food, and it begins to become an exporter of grain, measuring the success of this agricultural revolution. So we have four revolutions. We have the political revolution. We have the commercial revolution. We have the scientific and technical revolution. And we have the agricultural revolution. So that explains I think, a lot of what happened during the Industrial Revolution. But there's one last and final element that I wish to speak about. Yes, I have time. And this, I, I, uh, I think, goes under the subject of, of uh, counter-revolution. And this is um, the introduction of factory discipline. The introduction of factory discipline. Now, should understand that um, the, the factory and the University of Manitoba is the factory. You know, this is a disciplined place. Look at the arrangement here. Um, you're not attacking me directly. You have very, you've internalized the work discipline. You have to listen uh, everything I say. Uh, so I'm I'm saying that uh, the workplaces. Um, in the factory system, uh, there is, and the discipline at the beginning was ferocious. You can't even uh, imagine the discipline that was imposed by early industrialists on the workforce. It was a tremendous um, uh, disciplining process, and the workers had to learn to work to subordinate themselves to the machines and to the managers under the system. And uh, this was deliberate because what happened was that in the course of this early modern period that I'm speaking about, uh, there was a tremendous development of the skills and the versatility of craftsmen, of artisans. Uh, there was, uh, the, the, if you see the furniture, if you see the uh, whatever uh, we have of these are the antiques that date back to the 16th and 17th and 18th century. It doesn't mean, matter whether it's uh, pottery or, or uh, porcelain or silverware or fine furniture. You go to the, the WAG and you see uh, these uh, early productions. They were all made by craftsmen. Uh, and this craft skill developed all, well, it developed starting in the late Middle Ages, but it continued to develop. So craftsmen developed this uh, tremendous capacity to make things, to ma manufacture with your hand. Manus means hand, to manufacture. Hand manufacturing. 
um, became a characteristic of the emerging working class, especially in the manufacturing industries. Uh, uh, weavers made fantastic textiles. Um, and so there was this tremendous development of capacity amongst the workers. The thing was, and this was true in England, it was true all over Europe, France, uh, 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 Germany, etc. All of these countries, the, uh, the sort of hand manufacturing system was highly sophisticated. And even in the countryside, millions of peasants made a living by spinning and weaving alongside the small farms that they had. So there was this a system of, of um, manufacturing capitalist production prior to industrial factory production. But the problem was that especially in the highly developed uh, crafts, um, the artisans, um, uh, they, were, they were responsible for the increases in productivity before machines came along. The thing is that they, they, they were highly undisciplined, these people. Uh, they, uh, they would not listen to their master. They would not listen to their bosses. And uh, they could just, uh, because they had the freedom, they were not serfs, they were not slaves. They could leave a job, right away, you know, down tools and away you go. They wouldn't report to work on a regular basis. Uh, or they would have long weekends, which would continue into what they called uh, Holy Monday. They just took Monday off as they pleased to get over their hangovers. Uh, they would not work in a disciplined way. And so in a uh, certain sense, and you can see how the ultimately the undisciplined nature of all this in the French Revolution, because the French Revolution, the leading edge was made precisely by these people. These craftsmen were the ones who were the political agitators. They got political ideas. And so the coming of uh, the governments ultimately, uh, obviously, uh, uh, the new governments that took over in the 19th century wanted to keep these people in their place. And a lot of the struggle in the 19th century is about this, the struggle for democracy. But um, the, the coming of the industrial factory was part of the disciplining process. One of the things, first of all, it was the machines were more productive ultimately than the craftsmen, but also there was this great disciplining that went on with the coming of industrial capitalism. And certainly that was, uh, it helps to explain, you know, um, if you look closely at the uh, French Revolution, it's both, there is industrialization, it's lagging uh, the English case, but it's, it's developing. Uh, there's that, and there's a growing agitation on the part of these craftsmen. And so there is this clash going on, and ultimately industrial capitalism wins. Industrial capitalism, the masses are subordinated, and they learn to work in these factories or these workplaces. And so it has continued, uh, and we see uh, the drama in a new form as it unfolds today. And so with that, I conclude my narrative. And on Friday, we have the review of the last questions. See you on Friday.